But it is half past, so I might just get started and people might join while I'm doing my introductions. I'd just like to welcome everybody to the Health Services Research Association of Australia and New Zealand's webinar. I'm Sarah Green and I'm the Executive Officer of the association. Um, our webinars feature the best HSR in Australia and New Zealand and um, currently we're focusing on the winners of our 2018 awards and the Mabel survey was the winner of our 2018 impact award or joint winner of that award. Um, webinars are free to members and non-members but if you aren't a member of the association we just encourage you to go to our website and have a look at our um, membership options and benefits and think about joining and I'll just do a quick plug for the, the main activity of the association which is our um, health services and policy research conference which we're holding um, at the end of this year in Auckland on the 4th to the 6th of December and there's details of that on our website as well and a couple of housekeeping issues this morning um, you should be able to see and hear everything on the, uh, uh, the, from Tony, but we can't see or hear you, but you can chat using the chat button at the bottom of your screen. If you move your mouse around, you'll see those buttons. And if you have any questions for Tony, if you could type them in the Q&A box and the um, chair this morning will keep an eye on those and put them to Tony at the end of the session. And I think Tony's going to talk for about uh, 30 to 40 minutes and then we'll do the Q&A. Um, you can raise your hand as well if you want to ask questions and we've got quite a small audience this morning so I might have a little go at um, promoting people to panellists so that they can put the questions live but we'll see how that goes. And I'm going to pass over to Julie um, Redfern who is a new member of our executive committee and she's going to chair this morning's session, introduce Tony and handle the Q&A session at the end. Thanks. Okay, hi everyone. So my name is Professor Julie Redfern. I'm a Professor of Public Health at the University of Sydney. Uh, welcome to this webinar. It's nice to be here and, and have people online and also watching later. So my, my role here is to introduce Tony, then he's going to give a talk as Sarah said, and then um, we'll have some opportunity for Q&A uh, for a while at the end. So, in turn, so for Tony, I, I'm very pleased to be able to introduce him. He actually leads the Health Economics Research Program at the Melbourne Institute of Applied Economic and Social Research at the University of Melbourne. Um, and he has a PhD in economics. So, you know, this is always exciting in this area. And, and he got his PhD in, in the University of Aberdeen. He's an associate editor of the Health Economics and Social Science and Medicine. He's president of the Australian Health Economics Society and a member of the board of the International Health, um, uh, Health Economics. So his research interests focus on the behaviour of physicians and, and health workforce incentives and performance primary care in primary care and in hospitals. So I'm going to hand over to Tony and he's going to present today some of the lessons, as Sarah said, for engagement from the Maybell survey. So thanks, Tony. Thank you, Julie. Thanks a lot. And um, hi, everybody. And thanks to Sarah and the, and the association for um, letting me talk to you about this. Um, uh, what I want to broadly um, talk about is um, what we've done with the Mabel survey in terms of engagement. So what I'll do, first of all, is just outline what the Mabel survey is, for those of you who might not know very much about it, um, and, then, and then tell you what our plans are were for engagement and some of the outcomes of that engagement activity and I'll finish just by having some reflections about what we might have done differently um, uh, you know with the benefit of hindsight which is always um, a bit revealing so um, what I want to do is um, broadly the, there were three main aims of Mabel to get high quality research um, that informs and evaluates policy on the medical workforce Another aim was knowledge exchange between researchers and end users and to build capacity in health workforce research. When I came to Australia in, I don't know, 14 years ago, um, uh, I'm interested in doctors' behaviour and I couldn't get any data. Um, there was no Medicare data available really then. Um, that's changing a little bit, but nevertheless, there was no data on doctors at all or any other members of the health workforce unit record level. So I decided to do my own survey. Um, which, which is why we have Mabel. And the landscape's changed a fair bit over, over, over that time. Um, uh, so um, 
one of the um, what I mean what what Mabel does it it focuses on these kind of broad research areas. Um, I guess what I mean overall, I believe that you know the the supply side of the healthcare system is often the most important. Um, you know, with, within economics, we think of market failure and, and consumers not having any power in the market. Um, uh, they um, don't have information to choose. So the supply side, you know, does matter a lot. Um, I think, and that's why this is important to look at from from this perspective. Initially, Mabel was designed to um, look at three things which are partly reflected in this diagram, but not, not completely, because this is a, a kind of a, a newer version. But um, the first thing we were looking at is the rural issues, rural medical workforce. There's a distribution of healthcare professionals and doctors specifically across urban rural areas. Um, the second thing um, which is related to that was um, career choice, specialty choice as well. So what decisions are doctors making in terms of their specialty choice? Um, uh, and then also um, down at the bottom, we have enabling work-life balance. And, and we think of that partly in terms of hours worked. So one of the issues in terms of driving how many hours doctors work, workforce participation, um, of women in the medical workforce is a particularly important issue. Um, and, um, and so those are the kind of three things that's evolved over time. Um, uh, particularly um, to look at that work plan three, which is efficient practice and organization and new models of care, um, uh, which is to do with how medical doctors kind of organize themselves into medical practices. But then also um, health and well-being of doctors. Um, it's, it's a huge issue now and it influences everything else. It influences their career choices, their workforce participation, um, and, 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 and how they interact in, in in, in the workplace, so that is something that we've we've kind of we, we we've always um, captured information on self-assessed health um, for doctors and, and life satisfaction. But certainly in in the last wave wave eleven, we've got new questions in on mental health and bullying and that kind of stuff. Um, so so that, that that that's the the areas that Mabel covers, um, uh, and, you know, we, we set up the survey to, to answer some research questions within those areas, really about the drivers of these decisions. So it's a, it's a longitudinal survey of doctors, and we call it a panel survey because it, it, it's an annual survey, and it asks the same questions every year, okay? So unlike epidemiological longitudinal surveys, which may kind of um, do a baseline survey, and then each subsequent wave focuses on different issues, um, we actually do this in a panel survey context, and that gives us a strong study design um, because we can look at what factors for an individual doctor, so within doctors, change over time, and the effect of those changes on changes in outcomes, decisions, well-being, other things like that. So that's a very important part of the of the study design, which which makes us um, uh, you know move a bit closer to causality. We've got about 10,000 doctors each year responding um, across all doctor types, um, hospital doctors in hospitals and junior doctors, interns, registrars, GPs and non-GP specialists. To date, we've done 11 annual waves. The wave 11 is currently out in the field. Um, the first cohort of about 10,500 doctors, we've got about 5,000 of those left after 11 years. Um, each year, we, we have an annual top-up of new doctors coming in. So these are new junior doctors or doctors coming from overseas. So try and maintain the cross-sectional numbers between about eight and 10,000 a year over time. But those increasingly made up of these different new cohorts coming in as well as the original cohort of doctors. So we knew obviously that we we're going to get a pretty poor response rate from doctors. And initially we sent it out to all doctors in Australia in 2008. At that time there was 56,000 doing clinical practice about 20% of the population responded. So it was more a census that we did than a sample survey. Um, we are quite unique in terms of what we collect and what we do. There, there are, there are um, other surveys of the medical workforce. So the, so APRA, the Regulation Authority, conducts a survey. The Department of Health collects that data every year for, for, for doctors registering. Um, uh, with the Medical Board of Australia, and that has limited information, but still other information that we can use. 
Uh, but again, it's very hard to get that data. We, we haven't got it at an individual level yet and probably never will. It's very hard to get. It's not linked to anything. Um, so we do provide a, 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 a gap in, in, that, in that market. As I said, the study design of this panel survey means that we can move from looking at associations about factors that influence it, especially choice of rural location, to look at causality. Um, over the longitudinal part of it, it means that we can also do policy evaluation of, of, of interventions within that period, within the 10 years. So if there's some national policy interventions, such as a changes to rural incentive schemes, we can, and we know, because in Mabel we know where doctors are, um, we can actually evaluate the impact of that. Um, we, we need a range of information in Mabel. The surveys are quite long, uh, up to 80 questions um, in a survey. And that's because... Because of the panel survey, we, I mean, we don't, we don't ask questions such as like, um, uh, you know, um, why did you choose this specialty? We don't ask questions like that um, because often you get strategic responses. Most doctors, if you ask them where to rank, how, how income matters in the choice of specialty, they'll rank it low. But our other research has suggested it actually does matter a bit more than that. So how you ask the question is important. So we rather collect a lot of information about the factors associated with these choices, um, and then and then you know run models to kind of um, uh, realise those associations, but we don't directly ask, directly ask doctors why did you do this or why did you do that. You might want to do that cross-sectional survey and a panel survey. We don't do that. It's not about counting or, or describing. You know, there's other data sets that can count the medical workforce and how many you know um, obstetricians do we have in Darwin and that kind of thing. Mabel's not very good for that because the, the sample is, is small when you start to cut it down. Um, but we're interested in the why factors, why do decisions happen? And a lot of the surveys that's going on in the medical workforce at the moment really about counting and prescribing what's the size, what's the size of the bullying problem, for example. Every, every jurisdiction is doing a survey of junior doctors in terms of bullying. But what those surveys can't do is tell you why it's happening, what impact does bullying have on other, on other outcomes. Um, and Mabel is able, is set up to do that. Um, uh, so that's why it's a bit different. Um, so yeah, I'll, um, I'll 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 move on, but that's a bit more about the kind of design and why we did what we're doing. We also want to build capacity, but I mean, p p one of the grants that we had was a centre of research excellence from HMRC. So that's about capacity building. And again, when I arrived in Australia four years ago, the, the number of researchers doing research on the medical workforce who had published in that area, because obviously with NHMRC you need a good track record, it was very few. There's only a couple of people I could identify. Lots of people interested in our workforce, of course, but nobody who had a published track record in that area. So it was an aim to, to build this. So we, um, we let the data out. Uh, so we, we um, let people have um, de-identified unit record data for about $80. And you can get it, all 10 waves at the moment. Um, and we have about two to three applications per month. That I'll talk about that later. Um, we've had a lot of attendees over there. We'll have a data users workshop as well, where we, where we support data users in the use of longitudinal panel data um, and how to analyze that. Um, we've produced nine PhD students over 10 years and we've had 22 members of the, of the research team. We've also got some of Mabel data, about 2,000 doctors who consented to link their data to MBS and PBS. Um, and as I said, we've got a platform for policy evaluation now for a long period of data, and we can look at policy changes and see what impact they have on the medical workforce. Um, funding, so briefly in, in wave 11, um, we um, had most of our funding from the, from the Department of Health um, in the Commonwealth, and also some money from the Australian Digital Health Agency who had new questions in on, on use of digital technologies and shared health records somebody from DHHS here in Victoria. And then we have 10, uh, we had most of it from the University of Melbourne and other um, funds from those places as well. And we have one to nine, it was NHMRC largely, um, Health Service Research Grant and then a, and then a CRE. Um, and so, um, and some small amounts of money from the Department of Health and Health Workforce Australia. Um, at the moment, um, we aren't funded for Wave 12, so Wave 12 won't go ahead. Um, we have... Um, we are um, currently about to submit an NHMRC synergy grant, which will hopefully give us five years of funding. Um, and we've been through um, the Australian Health Minister's Advisory Council recently, who um, 
uh, didn't want to fund Mabel because we didn't have support of all of the states and jurisdictions. So I can talk about that later, about what impact Mabel has had um, and, and reflect on that as well later on. But at the minute, Wave 12 will be delayed until at least next year. Usually it would go out in April this year. Um, so our engagement framework, what do we do to engage? Well, um, one of our chief investigators, John Humphreys, um, uh, and uh, Matthew McGrail, who's another chief investigator listed on this, this paper, they, um, uh, based on existing literature that's listed there, which is more um, well known, um, put together a framework to kind of monitor the impact of health service research. So within that framework, we use this to try to um, form our engagement strategy uh, from the very beginning of, of, of Mabel and the grants we put in. We had to for the CRE, when we're, we're about five years in, a lot of it is about engagement, so we had to formalise this a bit more, but certainly in, even in the early days of Mabel, we, we knew that it was going to be very important to engage, not only to maintain our response rate, which is part of it, but also to, to have an impact. Um, uh, so so that, this is what we did. We, we kind of um, identified all our potential end users, so who, who, was, who might Mabel be useful to? And there was a lot of stakeholders, um, governments, endorsing organisations. So these are largely colleges who we wrote to in, to endorse um, the Mabel survey. So they appear on the front of the survey, partly to, you know, help us with response rates, um, but also um, to engage with it in, in other ways as well. So um, we, we were in contact with those regularly, other medical organisations and, of course, doctors themselves, the doctors who fill out the survey and who want feedback um, in order to help our response rate, but to get to them, for them to get to know what we're up to. So it was four things we looked at, which were summarized in that, in that previous paper. Building capacity for uptake amongst decision makers. So, you know, our governments and our endorsing organizations research friendly, do, do they understand the research process, do they understand the, the, the results that, that would be coming through and how it could apply to them. Generate knowledge based on user needs. So that was all about trying to engage about what the policy issues are nationally and for these different organizations. Effective dissemination, of course, is important, um, uh, which you know usually um, happens at the end, but also throughout. To, you, know, you need to let people know what you're doing. Um, and tracking the application knowledge, measuring how do we measure impact, you know, so that's another thing that that um, we um, uh, tried uh, to do. So I'll talk of those uh, in, in succession um, and then I'll, uh, at the end I said, try to um, tell you a bit more about what um, uh, we uh, actually achieved. So this um, is important because we, um, from the beginning, and actually before we put the grant in, um, the first health services grant put together um, an advisory group of key stakeholders to get them on board, to let them know what we're doing. Um, now, obviously, we had a list of about 100 stakeholders, and it was just not possible to engage with everybody. We focused more on national organisations, um, uh, the Department of Health, um, uh, um, Rural Health Workforce Australia um, and, and some of the other um, national doctor groups, AMA Council of Doctors in Training to cover, cover junior doctors um, and, and uh, you know, um, departments of health, but not all departments of health across all governments. Um, so we wanted, we wanted expertise, people who knew the policy issues, but we weren't necessarily seeking equal representation from everybody. Um, uh, uh, as I said, Mabel was designed to be a national survey to focus on national issues. Um, and so um, obviously those national issues are relevant to lots of different stakeholders, but it, but it, wasn't, it wasn't always about well, well, what issues are physicians or surgeons facing or what's happening in, specifically in New South Wales. Those issues were important to us. Um, uh, and, and, and we, um, you know, involved um, groups like that um, where issues came up. So that was something that National Advisory Group was important. It had specific terms of reference, really, for us to inform them about what we're doing. So initially it was a form of dissemination, but mainly it was about for them to inform us about what the policy issues were so we could frame the survey, 
you know, talk to them about the re broad research areas that we wanted to look at, which were important, um, and, 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 you know, continue to do that over time and develop um, those kind of issues over time. So um, uh, in a lot of workforce issues, medical workforce issues, you don't change that much over time, actually, but, but there are policy issues which come in from time to time, which everybody, um, you know, gets excited about. And, uh, and, and it's important for us to kind of... Uh, um, be cognizant of those issues and, and, and address them, try and address them as we come. So, so they, they weren't necessarily, um, they, they were advising us on issues, not specific questions to come in the survey, although that was part of the group as well. They would generate questions and, and issue, issues and then we would decide, well, is that, would that help? Can we research that question? Is it an important thing? So, so their, 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 their goal was a bit more broad in terms of, well, what are the issues? And then what are the key issues and research questions within that? We also held from 2012 when we, um, after the first few years, when we begin to, you know, produce research, it takes a couple of years to get papers out and research done. We started to hold an annual Mabel Research Forum and that was a much better forum for us to actually disseminate information to a broader group of people. About 80 people attend that forum each year. We've had that annually since. Um, and it's designed to kind of mix up the research um, the researchers from the Mabel team and others, external researchers, but also policy policy people as well. So we might have a session where, you know, a couple of people from the Department of Health and other organizations, what are the issues for them? And then we have some short 10 minute, 10 minute presentations about research that we've done, which is relevant to that issue. So we'll try to bring the research and policy people together in that forum specifically. Um, building capacity with decision makers. Um, I mean, this is, um, I mean, I guess this is kind of a bit harder. Um, uh, you know, what influence do we have on what happens in the Department of Health about how they view research and how they view evidence? Um, so a part of that for us was supporting the use of Mabel data out there. So, you know, um, endorsing organizations were offered free, simple descriptives for their specialty or their particular group. Um, uh, and, and, and so that they could see what's happened to their group over time. Um, data requests from end users um, started to come in, so we would support them, work out what they wanted, talk to them about it, um, support them in the use of data. Um, and, and so that's important as well to kind of just support their understanding of the data and how to use it effectively. Um, and then also we had some commissioned research. So there was, you know, DHSS wanted to, Victoria wanted, wanted us to look at, um, you know, the increase in the cost of the medical workforce in the state and the public hospital sector. So would Mabel would collect data on earnings and that kind of thing and, and compared that with some of their own data and that kind of thing. So we can, we can begin to see, they can, they can begin to see the value of the Mabel data and they, they may want to commission research from us, which, which we're not necessarily doing explicit research on, but actually builds capacity amongst them and gets them to use their the data and gets them to know about it. Um, effective dissemination, whoops. Uh, effective dissemination is mainly, well, it's, it's kind of the usual suspects, but certainly the targeted feedback of results was important for us. So when, it, when, a, when we knew a paper was coming out about to be published, um, we um, either did a media release or um, the last few years we've been hiring a freelance medical or health journalist to actually you know, come up with these articles and send them to things like MGA Insight and write the articles for us, write stories using the, the research and data results that, that, that might come out. So that was um, quite useful. Again, hard to judge the impact of that, but at least it gets the information out there. Um, uh, so we got Twitter and, and uh, um, LinkedIn and, and Facebook pages. Um, so that was um, important as well to kind of, again, feedback um, information to respondents and colleges and that kind of thing. Imagine the conference, we have a, an annual newsletter sent out to all survey respondents, who, anybody who's ever responded to Mabel just about two weeks before they get the survey, so it just primes them for the survey, but that also is helpful to, um, uh, to send it out more broadly and to, to summarize people with what we're doing. Um, and we also have, you know, um, invitations to speak at professional policy workshops and conferences about Mabel than the usual academic stuff, which is um, uh, important as well um, uh, in terms of engaging with, with our academic colleagues. Um, 
so what do we do? How do we measure what we did? And this is something that, again, we, um, we uh, designed from, um, uh, I'm sorry, we, we designed from, from um, that early paper that I just said from John Humphreys, who Australian Journal of Rural Health, the framework to, to look at uptake. So, so that's quite good. I do recommend you look at that paper because it's got an interesting classification of the different kinds of uptake and engagement that you can have. But we just put together a form really based on that. And every time somebody calls me about Mabel, I fill in the form, essentially. And all the chief investigators, all the research team do that. So we can begin to just track what things are coming in, who from. Um, and it also enables us to kind of follow that up as well, which is important because often people ring you up, you don't know really what's happened. Six months later, something else happens and they call you again. Well, they've used the data and, and you know, the, well, one issue is that they might say, request the data or data analysis request, it goes out. And um, we know kind of what we want to do with it, but we don't know what impacts it had. So, you know, we, it's kind of, it's tricky to follow up because there's a lot of things to follow up, but, but sometimes we can. And that enables us to construct narratives about what happened to demonstrate impact over time. So, you know, um, our involvement on, in, in government um, uh, committee work um, uh, in terms of what, what, how we are involved in that, what suggestions we make, feeding Mabel evidence in, what impact does that have on any policy recommendations that come out of that committee, and um, we'll try and document that. So we can construct uh, an impact narrative, if you like, for some things that we have done. Um, but a lot of that, although, you know, practically speaking, although we record a lot of it and measure it and use it to say, oh, have this many data analysis requests or this many people contacted this month, where we've been less good at following up, some of these things, um, some of them don't end up anywhere. They're just, it's, a, it's a request for information or clarification about the data, but some do, and we might not know about what actually happened. Um, so it, it, but, it's, but there's an issue about you know, um, the resources that we have to actually do that systematically. Um, so what impact have we had? Well, the, the major impact it, on national policy was um, the development of this modified Monash model. Now this, um, I'll, I'll tell you what this is briefly, it's a, it's a geographic classification system um, which you know, defines um, uh, metropolitan areas and different kinds of rural areas and that's used to deliver government incentives, mainly for doctors but for other things as well. So if you're a GP in Alice Springs and you're classified in a certain geographic area, then you would get government grants and, and things like that. So John Humphreys, who's listed here, he was a chief investigator on Mabel. And a lot of the impact that we have had on Mabel is um, through John and through his work in the rural um, area. Um, we've, all, we've all done work in the area, but he was the one who's very passionate about it and really pushed things forward with government. Um, so they were interested in developing these rural classification schemes and the existing ones that governments were using weren't very good. So essentially, um, they use Mabel data to um, uh, look at um, the differences in GP workload between metropolitan and different kinds of rural areas. And that was used to um, uh, support a new geographic classification that they developed. Okay, so can I just say that this, this is the biggest impact, but it was based on one table in a paper of descriptive statistics in 2008. It didn't use any of the complicated panel stuff that we've done with Mabel. This was one descriptive table. Um, so that's a lesson as well that policymakers do like very kind of simple um, messages and simple things that, that might be used to kind of develop something. So that is now being implemented across over a billion dollars worth of Commonwealth's grant programs, mainly in the health workforce area, um, for not only for doctors, but for pharmacists and things like that. Um, and I think it's also being used in age care and things to allocate resources across the country, essentially. People in rural areas might get more because they want to promote access to care in those areas. So John, for that, he, um, he, was, he was in connection with all of the rural health workforce stakeholders, Rural Doctors Association, National Rural Health Alliance, all of these groups which exist. Um, there was a Senate inquiry and we submitted, um, well, John submitted um, a report 
um, which, uh, which had, you know, they worked on these suggestions about how you might change this, um, the, the rural classification scheme. It was taken up by this Mason review, which was again another uh, big review of health workforce programs. So, so John was in the thick of this all the time and he was on the committees seeing this through. So it was a lot of effort. Um, and, and in 2015, it was finally um, adopted. Um, so there was a, you know, it's, it, if, if, if you have something that's important that, and you have support from the stakeholders, um, uh, which, which, which we were able to get, and through John's connections, then, then you know, that, that coalition of support um, helps that kind of national policy impact. So that was how that happened. This paper here that, I, that you can see, John and John Wakeman, who was also involved, they had another, um, one of the AFCRI CREs on, on rural health as well. Um, they've actually written about how, um, how they did it essentially in this paper. So it's a good um, paper reflecting about, about what they did and how that happened. So that's the main thing that we've um, done and been implemented with, with the Mayoral Survey. Um, through that and other things, we've developed a strong relationship with the Commonwealth Department of Health. Um, uh, John and Matthew um, were part of the technical working groups that developed the modified Menash model. And um, for the last couple of years, myself and John and Matthew again have been part of the um, Rural Workforce Distribution Working Group, which has changed, which is changing um, for this year the, the definition of the Districts of Workforce Shortage Scheme, which is used to, to um, get international medical graduates into rural areas. And so that, that involved us, you know, feeding Mabel evidence into that committee um, and, uh, and then relying on our expertise and the research that we've done to try and influence what, 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 what they've done as well. And, and also, you know, um, 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 broader than, than, than that as well, as got us into another, different, another few different committees. So, and, and the Department of Health funded Mabel in 2018, as I said, um, and, and that funding, again, was, um, we, I mean, we, we went around a lot of stakeholders. We, um, we got a lot of our stakeholders to write letters to Greg Hunt, the minister, um, so the AMA president wrote a letter in support of Mabel and rural health workers agencies and some of the colleges did as well. So we had, you know, um, maybe about nine or 10 letters of support from key stakeholders going to the minister and to the department, um, you know, seeing how wonderful we are. Um, and, and that um, led to funding of, of Mabel in 2018. So that, that's some measure of impact as well. These stakeholders felt that were important. Um, enough to warrant this and we're able to to um, spend the time arguing the case on our behalf and um, so that was um, uh, really re really really good as well um, other impact is that you know in terms of other inquiries that we get we get about one inquiry every couple of weeks about Mabel um, these include requests for data or analysis of data um, uh, invitations to speak at different meetings and conferences and serving on committees, so that's all recorded in our research uptake. And through these issues, we're able to to um, connect with with people and um, and uh, have an impact that way as well. So some examples here. In the last year, I spoke at the RSAGP Practice Owners Conference. They've just set up. We've been doing some work on linking Mabel data to whether GPs are in a corporate practice or not. Um, GP Training Advisory Committee to give an overview of the of the GP kind of workforce, where they're at, what the trends. Um, I mentioned the Department of Health Committees. We've been I'm going to the AMA Gender Equity Workshop in 23rd of March this year. We've partnered with ANZ Health um, to produce these health sector reports, which largely use Mabel data to describe um, the health workforce. Obviously, a lot of um, uh, doctors bank with ANZ and, and ANZ give them loans. So, um, so the, the, but this is also a very good way for us to actually you know, summarize Mabel evidence and trends and things that we've been finding on work-life balance over time into one broad report that's useful um, to kind of describe the sector. And lots of requests for information and things like that. So there's a few examples of things that, that, that we've been doing from external requests. So that gives some idea of the, of the demand we have for, for Mabel data and the research um, that we do. Um, as I said, we let the data out to researchers. Um, we, um, 
have an average of about 16 data applications a year. And, and that is where we give them the de-identified unit record data for all, all existing waves. So they get a data set for each of the 10 waves. They can link that obviously individual or linked over time. Um, so they can link all that together. These are mainly university researchers um, uh, who, who ask for the whole data set. Um, uh, you know, the College of Physicians have got the whole data set and so the Department of Health. Um, but essentially, um, it's really, um, uh, you know, universities and researchers who do that. Uh, and not just from the UK. Mabel is unique internationally. There's no other panel data survey like it. So researchers are really interested in it from other countries, from US and Canada. And we, we get data requests and we get visitors as well coming over. Governments and other stakeholders colleges are more likely to submit requests for us to conduct some analysis of the data because we just want a descriptive statistics or some cross tabs, something pretty straightforward. Um, so, um, you know, in, in their College of GPs annual report that they do on the state of the health sector, they've got some data from Mabel on GP job satisfaction over time, for example. Um, and, but but, but some, some of these stakeholders do have analysts who, who, who have the data as well. These are just a, a, a few of the data requests we've had um, over the last kind of 18 months, just to give you a broad view of, um, of the kind of organizations universities we have and um, for example Australian doctor here they they like to do an annual doctor's income report so they request um, some data on on doctor's earnings over time and how that's panning and who's earning the most so they love that so so that again um, helps us uh, you know um, push out the results of Mabel to, to to doctors who choose to read Australian doctor um, so I just want to reflect for a bit at the end about how we could have done things differently. I'm saying that only because Wave 12 is at risk of not going ahead now. Um, uh, as I said earlier, um, we have had some good uptake and some good impact over the years. Um, uh, we have, um, you know, after the CRE finished, we, we applied twice more for another CRE to, to NHMRC, but didn't get it. Um, so hence the last two waves have been funded um, from others and externally. Generally, governments find it hard to give money for anything more than a year. They don't want to commit to that kind of thing. Um, funding from in, within the Department of Health this year is much tighter than it was last year, so they're not able to, to assist this year. So, you know, and we've got, we've got lots and lots of stakeholders who by themselves, you know, wouldn't be able to afford to fund Mabel, but even if they put in some money, we've got 20 people putting in small amounts of money and that's quite difficult to manage because all of those 20 people will want something very specific in return for that and balancing all that and trying to keep the um, integrity of the panel survey, um, which is about the quality of the data that we're having, that we produce is, is tricky. So some reflections on, could we have done things differently? Um, uh, so I want to distinguish first between the, and it's a bit different to a lot of the research projects because we're producing a data set as well that we give out. And, and that can have an impact independent of the research that we're doing on Mabel. Okay, so that's, that's something to consider again. Would we have thought about that a bit differently and separate that out a bit more? Um, because obviously the impact from our research that we're actually doing is, is um, it needs to be handled in a different way. Okay, so that's, that's the first thing I want to raise. The second thing is Mabel is national, not local. As I said earlier, if you want to know how many obstetricians are in Darwin, don't come to Mabel um, because the response rate is, isn't great. If you want to know, you know, to get a picture of what's happened to cardiothoracic surgery over the last 10 years, don't come to Mabel because we haven't got enough cardiothoracic surgeons answering it. The, the biggest cohort each year of a single specialty it might be say anaesthetists and psychiatrists where we have about 500 each doctors each year over time and um, remember you know our response rate is about um, you know 20 percent of the population um, so you know I can think of in any area any hospital or any specialty we've got about you know 20 percent or fewer doctors answering me um, so when you get down to those kind of areas and cut the data the data doesn't become very useful. So, but on national stuff, it is very useful because we have a national picture across the whole medical profession 
Um, and so, you know, different users have different needs. Um, Department of Health, obviously, is a national picture, so we've kind of focused on them a bit. Um, uh, as I said, we, we didn't get funding from AMAC because um, a lot of the states didn't support it, although we've been working closely with Victoria and New South Wales and, and in the early days, Queensland. It's been difficult for us to connect to state health departments, to be honest. It's, it's hard to know who's working on health workforce in there and people move around. So, so and we, and we have been doing stuff specifically for um, all states, you know. So that's been another thing that we perhaps could have done more of and, and promoted ourselves more. But again, with the benefit of hindsight, here we are. Um, uh, and also I think we, you know, because this was fun about NHMRC to begin with, we are focusing on issues, some issues which actually are quite sensitive and sometimes the medical profession might not like what we're doing because actually Mabel is not run by a group of doctors. It's, um, I'm an economist, I've got health service researchers. Um, so obviously we're in close connection with the medical profession and through the advisor group and other, and other ways and, and, and formally. Um, but it hasn't been run by doctors. So, so you know, um, the fact that we're looking at fees and out-of-pocket costs, the fact that we're looking at, you know, some papers on the public-private choices of medical specialists. I mean, you know, although that might not be interesting to the government of the day or the medical profession of the day, actually, we think it's still a big public policy issue um, that, that we need more evidence on because in four or five years' time, it might become an issue. Um, so... There's that trade-off as well between actually doing what the people you engage with want and doing what we think is kind of generally important from our view of the world, which is a bit more independent, a bit more um, uh, agnostic um, about health policy. We don't, you know, support a certain party or support a certain group. So we've got to kind of spread our wings a bit and, and although try to keep everybody happy, that's not always possible um, because I said we have a, a large group of stakeholders. And that comes to the next thing, you know, should we have had a more focused engagement strategy um, and going forward, should we do that? So maybe we've got many issues and many stakeholders that we're looking at. I said the biggest one that we've had the best impact with is a rural um, uh, stakeholders. You know, that, that has really, um, they've really engaged with Mabel a lot and, and realized that it's a really important data set to try and work out why doctors aren't going into rural areas. That's been the main thing, and we've produced a lot of evidence on that. So that's a big single issue that we've looked at, but there are lots of other issues, perhaps, that, that we haven't directly um, looked at. So, so should we have done more of that? Should we have, um, you know, over, over time, we've done a lot of work on gender in the medical workforce, and, and that's something that over time now, I mean, is what evidence has, have we gathered? Can we put it together to say, what have you learned from me about gender? But that kind of thing takes time. So, you know, um, issues about that, it, how we engage and where we focus our efforts is important. We didn't have dedicated communication staff. We've got people at the university here who, who help with media releases and, and, and that, but, but our engagement strategy, our communication strategy, if you like, um, was, was essentially up to the chief investigators to implement. Um, you know, um, we know that, you know, the Grant Institute spends a lot of time on that kind of stuff and, 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 and going to taking a piece of research and, and going around um, uh, all the government departments and talking about it. So, you know, it, it takes time. Engagement is costly. Um, chief investigators, we need, we need better support from the university and our organisations, I think, in this um, for these particular projects, um, beyond just media releases, you know, we need somebody to come and say, look, here's, he, this should be your engagement strategy for this particular project. This is what you should do, you know, and have a plan ahead um, and, and put together a plan. Somebody, we, we, we need help with that as academics, I think, um, uh, because we, we aren't usually trained in that. Um, and, um, and I mentioned about the difficulty in getting funding for a journal survey with NHMRC, you know, oh, maybe let's have the chance. You're asking the same questions every year, what's new? Well, actually, the value is in, is in this panel data, is in about having stronger evidence about these issues as time goes on. And also we do, we have put in new questions. Um, each year there's some small new questions and we have 11, we put a lot of new questions in and took some out. Um, uh, but again, trying to make it look new um, 
is is hard for policymakers, I think. Um, but we're still producing lots of interesting stuff. There's so much stuff that we actually haven't had time to analyze all the resources to analyze yet. Um, you know, I think when we did the Mabel CRE, um, we had about a couple of research fellows to do the research. The rest was about the funding the survey. So, you know, they, there's lots of issues and trade-offs that we've made over time. Um, could we have done it differently? Probably. Um, it would be nice to have, a, have had a better plan at the beginning about how we do this systematically and had the resources to do that. Um, uh, but, uh, but I think we still did pretty well out of it. Um, uh, you know, we'll, we'll hopefully, I'm still optimistic for, for, for wave 12 and, um, and we'll see what comes up, but certainly um, uh, that's just a bit of a broad overview and some honest reflections about what we've done and what we could have, could have done differently. So I'll be um, happy to, um, uh, to, uh, to take some questions now if there's any. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Tony. Clap, clap, clap. <laughs> that was, uh, you know, amazing presentation and, you know, I think an amazing body of work, really. Um, okay, so I think the... You're dropping out a bit, Julie, I think. Bye. Can you hear me now? Oh. Yeah, it's a little bit better. You're just dropping out. Can you hear me? I don't know. Okay. Um, I think the idea is that people would type a question into the chat, which uh, there's a click on the bottom of your screen if you hover your mouse where it says chat. I think that's the idea. You can type a question in there and I'll be looking to see if there's some questions coming in that we can ask. Um, just while people start to do that and work out how to do that, Tony... I am not a doctor. I am an allied health professional. And, the, you know, whilst I think this is an amazing piece of work, the first thing that comes to my mind is, is there anyone doing anything similar for the other workforces, for other health groups like allied health and nursing, for example? No, no. There was, when we first started, there was, um, oh, I can't remember her name now, in at UQ, they started like a, an online-only survey of nurses and doctors at the same time. But because it was online, the responses weren't great, and that stopped after a couple of years. Um, and we also did a, a one-off nursing survey in Victoria um, in 2008 or nine as well. Um, but I guess, you know, the, the, um, the only surveys that I do know are the registration surveys now, which are conducted by APRA. Um, where, you know, as a health professional, before you register, before you pay your registration, a survey pops up and you have to complete the survey before you register. So they get close to 100% response rates. And um, would have been nice to have Mabel shoved in there. But, um, but th those are the only surveys that we know about. And they ask a, um, um, just a couple of pages on, on work settings and hours of work. But that's, and it's not, you know, there's no data linkage at all there. So there isn't anything like it for any other profession that I know of um, that's national in school. Yeah, okay. I mean, I think that's fascinating and, um, you know, it, it's provided a fantastic opportunity for really, you know, monitoring and evaluating and having a major impact on, on this medical workforce. And I guess just for me to comment, really, um, as much as you might want to sort of comment a bit further, two things. One is, you know, I really like the way you describe and monitor how you've had an impact and obviously we know now for research funding, this is even being uh, more widely recognised and the importance of it. So I think you've even got a, a great model here for, for measuring and, and documenting um, the impact that you've had. So that's one thing I thought you might just want to comment on a little bit more and the challenges associated, which you've already touched on. And the other thing that I picked up for throughout this You, you just dropped was out the importance of the stakeholders, you know, as we know in health services research. Oh, did I drop again? So the yeah. importance of stakeholders right through from the start to the very, yeah. very end uh, in terms of impact and implementation, but, you know, also in terms of money and, and on every level. So I, I guess I was just looking, I was just going to ask you to comment a bit more about those things. Look, I think that's right. I think the, you know, um, the stickle thing is important because it's, I guess it's all about co-production and that kind of thing and, and get them involved right from the beginning. Um, uh, but also given what we wanted to do, um, recognizing that some issues 
some stakeholders wouldn't come up with or wasn't important to them, but was important more generally, you know, I think. So I think having that balance is very important, um, you know. Um, over time, this is a longitudinal service. Obviously, we had to engage over time as well. And, you know, I guess, you know, we... And, and that and that did bring a lot of support for Mabel over time when we're going for refunding and things like that. Um, uh, and and that and that and that has mattered a lot as well, I think, to to get them so that they're um, involved enough to feel that that they have some ownership over it. Um, I'm not sure we did that enough, to be honest, um, uh, because it was set up as an HMRC project. It wasn't funded straight from the government straight away. We owned it, right? We the researchers owned it. And we had the final say about lots of things, but and how it was set up and how it went on. But I think, you know, we, we perhaps could have done more to get stakeholders to have more ownership earlier on as well, I think. Um, uh, and, but, you know, again, a reflection, not sure whether that would have made a difference, but, um, but I think we, 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 we did as well as we could, given how the thing was set up in the first place as an HMLC project. Yeah, and look, I think that concept is important um, learnings for you to to share with other investigators the importance of those stakeholders from the very start. So, you know, and I like obviously this is a this is a great project because the end users, you know, are intimately involved all the way as well, which yeah. I thought was powerful. Sarah, did you yeah. want to to say anything else? Yeah, there's a um, question. There is a question. Question in the Q and A box. Can you see that from Oliver? Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. So someone's um, put forward a question, uh, Tony. What what kind of benefits do you see um, with this data being linked to things like PBS in terms of informing medicine policy? Um, so I think it was uh, thanks, Oliver, for that. Um, I know Oliver fills in the naval surveys, a GP in Adelaide, an academic. So thank you uh, for yeah. that. Being in contact with him a couple of times over the years, but. Um, Look, I think the data linkage, we've, we've wanted to do a number of things. We've got one paper um, just come out in BMC Health Service Research, which we can send, which, which we looked at the uptake of um, novel oral anticoagulants um, mm -hmm. over time. So that they were introduced in 2013 in the middle of the Mabel data. Um, and so we're able to link the exact day that a doctor first prescribed that medication through the PBS data to all of their rich data from the survey, in, including things like risk aversion and, um, and hours worked and, and, and also their, their general propensity to prescribe and that kind of thing. So, so that's the first paper that we've looked at, um, uh, you know, in terms of um, looking at prescribing uh, and uptake and how that, that, that comes through. One of the things there as well, actually, we found that, that there's a really strong gender effect that men are first to prescribe much quicker than women. Um, uh, but we've got another paper focusing on the gender thing where actually with, we're, we've kind of nuanced it a bit where we think it's actually, it, the, the time to the first prescription is not the right outcome. It, it's actually, do you appropriately prescribe? <laughs> and, and, and because women take the time and, and don't rush to get the prescription or whatever, then, then at least um, we think that, that, that it, the, the, just the, the time to the first prescription, although it's important in uptake, it's not maybe the right outcome measure that we're looking. It's actually about appropriate prescribing of, of, of new drugs and, and not how fast it happens. Um, so that was something that came out of that that's, that's quite useful. Uh, and what about ha have some of the stakeholders around the quality use of medicines such as NPS been interested in this work? Yeah, so um, uh, Yuting Zhang, who just joined us last year from Pittsburgh, she, um, it was work that, that, that she was involved with, with Susan, and she was here on an Australian-American Health Policy Fellowship, so she was engaged with, uh, um, uh, with the Department of Health, the pharmaceutical section up there on this paper, and so they were quite interested in what we're doing as well. I'm not sure if I need to follow up with her, what, what impact it might have had has just come out, so... Um, uh, but yeah, something that, that we still need to um, look at in terms of how to um, best to kind of um, encourage the, 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 the uptake of, of new drugs. Okay. And then there's one other question here from Oliver, who's a GP, um, who, who recognised there was some suspicion among some of the GPs in yeah. the Down Under Closed Facebook group, which I'm not 
familiar with um, around, yeah. and I must admit, as you were speaking, I was wondering to myself, uh, you know, the end users potentially can benefit from participation in that and there perhaps is some conflict of interest there, but um, yeah. Oliver's asking, uh, did did it help recruitment? Um, he's, he's advocating for this Mabel yeah. survey look, think, down on Facebook. Look, I think we, yeah, the, the, there was an issue when we sent out the consent forms to doctors, we, we got a bit of not quite hate mail, but um, asking for the MBS to extend, you're asking for the income really in the revenue. Um, and um, one doctor um, did send me an envelope, a return, a Mabel reply paid envelope um, full of pills um, back, which is interesting. Um, I was going to tweet about that, but anyway. Yeah, sorry. Um, but, um, but so, and I think we did take a hit on the response rate um, that year when we asked for consent for that information. Um, uh, but, you know, I think it was still worthwhile doing because I think, you know, this kind of data linkage really gives us some important answers. And, you know, we are sensitive to um, the research that we do um, and the impact that it has. And as I said earlier, you know, um, some of the research that we do um, might not, uh, as, as we all know, right, it, it, it doesn't meet with people's expectations about how things were or working from their point of view, and it may not support what they're trying to do, or who knows, some of the things we're doing might not support what the college is trying to do or what the AMA is trying to do. Um, so we have to be sensitive to that because, and we do have a response rate to, th to think about. So I have been, you know, I I'm conflicted <laughs> um, in yeah. some sense as well. Um, uh, you know, uh, uh, and it does, it, it does make us um, uh, just, you know, be very cognizant about, about what we're doing, how to bring people along with us, how to talk to them about these issues and how it shapes the research um, that we do. So I think those issues are quite real. Um, you know, only, only 20% of doctors chose to fill out and maybe a lot of doctors do want to fill it out for lots of different reasons, right? And, um, uh, and that's something that, um, you know, we, we have to deal with in, in, in how we communicate the research and set it all up. So I think the conflicts are important and, um, you know, um, a, a lot of doctors I speak to love Mabel. Uh, others, others wouldn't wouldn't fill it in at all. You know, so um, mm. you know, we, we 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 do what we can. Yeah. Okay. Look, I mean, I don't think there's any other questions at the moment, unless Sarah wants to to ask anything. But you know, I mean, I think the the you touched on it, the governance and the overarching management of a big program of work like this. I. I yeah. think, you know, I can't even imagine how complex it is. And, and you know, standard research funding doesn't, as you, yeah. as you alluded, doesn't really uh, enable all of those things. I can only commend you. Sarah, did you have anything else? No, I don't have anything else to add. Just, just to let people know that, that we have recorded this morning's webinar and it'll be up on our, the HSRA and Z website in a, in a day or so. People want to view it or share it with, with colleagues. And just to thank Julie and, and Tony for a great um, discussion this morning. Thank you both. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks, Tony. Thanks everybody for participating. And don't forget the conference. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Tony. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Sarah. Bye. -bye. Bye.